Hey everyone, how you doing? It's Jonathan Lip here from the Big Apple Film Festival. Welcome to our final conference uh, for the weekend. Thank you all for being here. And our final conference is on the art of screenwriting. So we have uh, two guests with us today. Uh, we are supposed to have a third as well, but I don't believe he is here yet, but we'll keep an eye out for him. So we have with us, uh, we have Emmy winning writer, director, Producer Jillian Gunther with us. Hi, Jillian. How you doing? All right. Uh, you just yeah, can you just unmute yourself there, Jillian. Hi. All right. Hello. How you doing today? Good. All right. Uh, and Jillian's screenplay, pleased to meet me, was a uh, semifinalist at the Big Apple Film Festival screenplay competition. And then we have with us Spider One. Hey, Spider. How are you? Hey. How are you doing? That's a screaming baby in the background that is will be muted in a moment. All Sorry, right. mom. <laughs> And Spider's uh, horror script, Haver Hill, was a winner of the horror competition for Big Apple. So congratulations to both of you. Oh, yeah, thanks. It was a pleasant surprise. Cool, thanks. So let's um, first, let's give a bit about your, your background. Um, we'll start with Jillian. Um, you've worn many hats uh, in the uh, film and media industry um, for quite a number of years. If you want to tell us a bit about your background and your experiences and how you started and where you're at now. Sure. Um, I... Started out, you know, I started writing plays. I grew up in New York City, so I started writing plays and doing downtown theater stuff as a teenager and uh, ended up going to NYU for theater as an actor and sucked and um, realized that I would be better off writing. Um, so I started, I continued to write plays um, and uh, got my first writing job at Nickelodeon. Um, and, uh, they gave me a bean bag and a bunch of stuffed animals and a computer. And it was like, you know, hilarious, weird job to have, uh, writing like SpongeBob SquarePants promos. And, um, so that was really fun. And then I did a bunch of stuff for them for the short lab. And after a bit, I ended up doing, uh, making short films, um, narratives and, uh, uh, writing PSAs and just doing various work like that and then I made a documentary and then I suddenly started doing documentary and then I moved from there into sort of audio I did like this American life um and then came back to some doing now screenplay writing again and still doing uh tv writing for and uh directing for money cool and which um tv uh shows are you involved with now uh, right this second, I'm not doing anything, but I tend to work on things like, um, I did a bunch of episodes of this, uh, NBC show called Who Do You Think You Are? Um, which is a really fun show to work on. Um, I worked on a show called, uh, you know, I did a lot of kid shows, uh, really love doing that kind of silly, ridiculous stuff. I did a show that was an Arthur spinoff called Postcards from Buster, um, and, uh, I can't even, you know, a bunch of other stuff that is really fun in process, but who cares about it once you make it? That's the thing about TV writing. As long as it's fun to make, you know, you're just contributing to uh, space trash, as Robert Altman liked to say. Right. Uh, I was very cynical, sorry. Really you don't, do you feel that way about TV now, though? I mean, I feel like it's sort of flipped that the value of television is, is, is such a different perception now than it was, uh, you know, even 10 years ago. Yeah, I think fiction television is amazing. I think documentary is a word that doesn't have any meaning anymore. So you end up, you know, I've done a lot of nonfiction television writing. You still have to structure it and do all that. But so much of that, you know, the meaning is just like, I mean, I don't know, ever, I'm sure a lot of people watch The Thou. To me, that was an HBO show. And that to me feels like reality television. Like I watched somebody make avocado toast, you know, in that, and, and it's a 10 episode show that could have been a, an, what I feel like is a, an informational, interesting story driven documentary if it had been like a quarter of the length. So I, yeah. I feel like, you know, so that's, but yes, fiction television, amazing stuff to do now. Yeah. So uh, yeah, Spider, you want to tell us a bit about your background? You're musician now and but you, you're also involved in film as well um you want to tell yeah. us a bit about your, your background yeah i mean i uh 
left, I started out more of a, as a visual artist painting and stuff like that. I went to uh, uh, the museum, uh, uh, School of Museum of Fine Arts in, in Boston for three months and then decided that being in a band would be way more fun than like still lifing and drawing, you know, naked people. Um, so I dropped out of school with no plan whatsoever, no qualifications as a musician or in, but just real, you know, wanted to start a band because I loved going to see live bands. And uh, so I did that and uh, ended up having like a lot of success with it and um, still do it to this day, but also had a dual love of film and television and, you know, ever since I was a little kid watching Siskel and Ebert, like they made me understand like, oh, it doesn't have to be a passive adventure. You know, you can actually take, think about it and think about character and story. And, and so, um, so I, I, um, I was involved with some, some different things, writing in, in a cave. And I wanted to, I wanted to have my own TV show, just like I wanted to have my own band and having absolutely no qualifications. And I bought a couple of books, like how to have a TV show or whatever. And after about three pages, threw them in the trash because it told me I had to go to school for writing and then I had to be a writer's assistant for four years. And then I had to do this. And I was like, this is a way I'm going to do this. Like, so I've got to figure out a different way. Um, so I went out and um, with a couple of friends and a cheap camera and shot uh, a, uh, a test trailer for this idea I had called Death Valley, which was a, a horror show. And uh, lo and behold, ended up selling it to MTV and we had a, we we did a season of that where I create you know was creator and executive producer on that and it was a horror comedy and you know really it it gave me like a crash course in how all this stuff works um, and since then I've just been doing a lot of writing in the in the script the the, the feature that that I submitted to Big Apple was like the first script I ever wrote I just wanted to see if I could you know get past ninety pages you know because I'd been used to writing shorter content. And so I did it. And uh, since then, I've written a bunch more. And I've, and more recently, I've been uh, writing, producing, directing, wardrobe, catering. You know, a bunch of horror shorts that I've that I've that have been out on the festival circuit. So I'm sort of like, just just like I, I was with music. I I I don't, I'm not never happy with one lane. Like I sort of have to have my hands in everything <laughs> because that's that's sort of what music is like, you know, in a sense, when you're in a band and you have to tour and you have to do, you're doing everything. Um, so I didn't, I don't really understand the concept of just picking one thing and, and letting other people do the other stuff, you know what I mean? So. so me I, I have to say that that's exactly, I mean, that was a better version of, you know, a positive, interesting version of the same. <laughs> I mean, I was in a band, I also do, you know, podcasting, I do, you know, visual art, I do, I make short films, I do documentaries, short and long, I did, you know, I, I, you know, I worked on New Yorker Presents and did short films for them. And I think the same thing, I never went into the writer's room. Um, and I picked up a screenplay that was really one of the first ones that I'd written in, you know, early 2000s, and then submitted it to this too, to see what would happen. Yeah, so I have a similar background so we're that's an interesting too bad there's not the person who went to the writer's room on this panel too so <laughs> if anybody has any questions you just put it right in the q a box and i see one coming in already and i'm going to get to to the questions but real quick i just want to ask um uh, i'll go to jillian first and then spider can you um just tell us a bit about your scripts jillian pleased to meet me if you just want to give us a quick overview of what it's about you mean yeah yeah so it's about um a uh, girl who uh is uh, turns 35 and, and realizes that five years earlier she was, thinks she was on the precipice of success and love and uh, everything that she thought she wanted finally and then five years later is at the bottom and is uh, really disillusioned about how she blew it and ends up uh, going back five years and in meeting her self who was on the precipice and is so ashamed that she um, blew it that she lies and tries to change it behind herself back. And um, so it's it's really about sort of, uh, you know, it's a comedy about um, how things fall apart in such a short amount of time and the way you perceive yourself and how you have to accept who you are. Um, and, uh, but it's, re it's really like, it, it's sort of like a Hanna-Barbera cartoon in a way as a, you know, it's not, it's not a rom-commy serious. It's got a more kind of quirky 
sort of uh, story. So, so yeah, it's about what happens when you go back in time. Cool. Uh, spider. Can you tell us about Haverhill? Yeah, well, in, not to correct you, but it's actually, this is what we pronounce Haverhill, which is a weird Massachusetts thing because it's, it's Haverhill is a town that I, I grew up in. It's like a northern Massachusetts factory town, you know, lower working income. And uh, the, 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 the movie, the script is, is really about the story of these three high school friends who inadvertently kill one of their high school teachers and remarkably get away with it and how that follows them through life. And so it's a series of, you know, flashbacks to when they were kids to when they're adults. And the three friends took like remarkably different paths. One became a very successful TV host in, uh, in LA hosting sort of like an American Idol show. And one, the other two stayed in the hometown. One became a reasonably successful dentist and the other one is just a big giant loser. Um, and uh, it's so, so it sort of follows their path of how this horrible event that they were all part of bring them back together and eventually back to this, the exact spot where they, where they buried the teacher in the woods. Um, really it's about, you know, to, to be, to, not to, to, to talk about it too much, but really what it, was inspired by was my own and a lot of the characters are based on kids I grew up with and it, it's really about when you think back to when you were a, a teenager and the shit you did that had it gone one inch this way or one inch that way your life could have been turned upside down and you know I remember we would walk across you know running through the the center of our town was a river and over the river was a train bridge now, as kids, we would walk across the train bridge in the middle of the night with no idea what time the train was going to come. The only option if the train came was to get hit by the train or dive into the river and drown, you know. So, like, things like that, it just it always still stuck with me. Like, my God, like, the stupid shit we used to do that it just so lucky that, you know, and I, and I thought of this, this idea of that, you know, they, they stumble on, uh, they're walking through the woods one day and they, and they see somebody laying uh, on the ground and, and he's having an epilep epileptic seizure and, and it turns out it's one of their teachers. And of course the shittiest kid starts fucking with him, you know, until the point where they actually end up killing him. And when you're 16, 17, you don't know what to do in those scenarios. You generally don't have that part of your brain that has developed into understanding consequence. So of course they do the complete wrong thing, which is bury this guy. And it just goes on to haunt them forever right it's, uh, it's, uh, the train bridge um thing that if you ever seen the movie stand by me there's a scene like that i don't know if you remember the movie but yeah yeah yeah. The bridge, and they had to jump you know jump off um jillian so uh, question for you when sitting down to write a script um what is sort of your first uh would you outline first do you have a concept or a theme in your mind first do you have characters in mind first what's the sort of the starting point when you sit down to write a screenplay I feel like I don't have a method. I feel like I, um, it, it, it start, I'm, most of everything I do is character driven. So it's um, a character that I start with. Um, I mean, that screenplay particularly, it was, I made a documentary that is pretty much that screenplay. It's called Pull Out. It's on, it's on, you can see it online. Um, but it's, it's pretty similar. It was this, it was, the character was a version of me you know, and I was 35 and I was thinking about how, how did everything go so south in such a short amount of time? And, um, you know, so I sort of, that question, I usually like to start with a question and a character. And then the question as you work, uh, and I don't outline, I just write stuff and follow the story um, and then go back and rewrite um, and do, Go, do a lot of organizing of other like you know drawers and stuff in the middle of that too um you know but uh so that story sort of unfolded um with this question and the question changed over the course of writing it um it doesn't have to be answered but it gives me something to work from so that's that's the the most structure i give myself is who is this person and what is the question that the story or the character is asking um, cool. and you know, and it's obviously not the question that you ask in the beginning is not, you know, when, if you look back and say what went wrong, like I, the documentary version of that was, you know, what went wrong 
And the answer is, oh, it's, that's not, it's much more complicated than that. It's not that something went wrong. It's that everybody, per, you know, you, you perceive it differently then than it really happened. And that there, there isn't really um, a, a definitive answer to that. You're a different person. Um, so if anybody has any questions, you can put it in the Q&A box. And we have one here, actually. Somebody asked Spider um, for any advice on, let's see, uh, writing horror comedy. Any advice for a fellow horror comedy writer? Yeah, I mean, advice, that's a, I don't know what that means. But I mean, it's, it's been so inter interesting. I ended up doing the, the show Death Valley was ended up being a horror comedy. Um, but I was never that interested in horror comedy. I just like, the, I, I feel like it's, it's worked like in small, like Shaun of the Dead, amazing, right? Like, but generally speaking, it wasn't a genre that I liked my horror scary and I liked my comedy funny and I didn't really put them together. But when I sold the show to MTV, my original idea was that it was going to be serious. And they said, look, we love this idea of cops and monsters, but we want it to be a comedy. And I thought, well, this could be a great, com you know, as long as, you know, I didn't feel like I was compromising because I thought there was a great funny version of it. But to, to answer the question, um, I think the, my advice would, would be to make sure those two, uh, for me anyway, how, what makes it work is if the two still function as they should. In other words, if you're having a scary moment, make sure it's really scary. If you're having a gore moment, make sure it's disgusting. But if you're having a funny moment, make it funny. Don't try to make the horror funny because I think that's where it gets like blurry for me. And, you know, there shouldn't be anything funny about somebody getting like their head chopped off. You know what I mean? Um, you know, don't, don't make it cartoony. And I think if you do those two parts separately and then and they intersect in, in this world, it creates an uneasy feeling that is more successful than just trying to be like, make everything kind of like cartoonish and, goofy you know what I mean that's I guess would be in a, in a simple sense what I would do, advise okay so keep the two keep them sort of separate you got the comedy side you got the horror side well just yeah have them function as they should you know um and then that will make I think make the funnier parts funnier and the scary parts scarier I mean right. in Death Valley we would try to do that we would have moments that were legitimately like kind of terrifying but then you know, other parts that were just, because that is life. Like if you have friends that are really funny, but you know, serious things happen in their life too. And so those, I think it just becomes more realistic that way, even if you're dealing in a sort of fantastical premise, you know? Right. Um, there was a question for both of you. Um, they, um, somebody asked, um, uh, how long did it take both of you to finish your scripts? So Jillian, how long did it take you to write your screenplay? Um, I wrote that screenplay very quickly in the beginning, and then I put it down, uh, and then I wrote it again. Um, I think I spent about solid three weeks, four or five times over the course of the last 15 years, where I went, hey, that was a cool idea. What would it be like now? How do I think about, you know, so I think I revisited it, and this last time I did that as well. Um, and actually the script that I submitted to you guys was took place in the five years was 90, 1996 and 2001, which was a time in New York that I really knew. Um, and I'm actually rewriting it. So somebody said, oh, we want to produce this, but only if you set it currently. Mm -hmm. And at first I thought, I can't do that. That's not, I don't, I don't even know what it means today, you know, to be, but I am doing that and um, right now and working with um, somebody as a writer's assistant um, who's a smart person who's living this kind of, you know, who's in her mid twenties right now doing um, and went to grad school in New York for screenwriting and getting her perspective on what that same experience is like now so, and uh, sort of researching it and updating it. But um, that was the long answer to, um, you know, I like to work in spurts. Um, and also because I'm doing a bunch of projects at the same time. So whenever I have this spurt and, you know, I'm finished procrastinating, I sit down and don't get up for three weeks. Right. Spider, how long did it take you to write the... Uh, I don't remember because it was a while ago when I wrote it, but I don't think very long. And I, don't, I, I find that 
when I write, uh, you know, other scripts or even shorts, you know, if, even if I'm dealing with eight to 10 pages, I tend to write really fast. Because I think the trick is to sort of have the whole story mapped out in a general sense in your head. I think when people, you know, I always find like, I have friends who are, oh, I've been working on this screenplay for four years. I'm like, how is that even possible? Like, how are you care that much? Like it, in other words, I, I feel like it must, you must not know what your story is or you, or must not be that interesting because if you have to work that hard at it, it's sort of, it's not, it's not unlike uh, writing songs. Like the best songs I've ever written literally get written in about five minutes, 10 minutes. The songs that you're like in this, you know, I don't know, this chorus isn't working, ugh, it, just throw it away. You know, I've, I've learned to just discard things because it's just not working. So I think anything I've ever written, including Haverhill, is, was pretty fast. And not a bunch of drafts. Like I'll write one draft and then just kind of go, oh, I spelled this wrong or this or be funny. And maybe, you know, I'm just, I don't do like complete teardowns and start. I just, I'll just add if it seems a little funny here or confusing you know you just change it and I think but I think really the trick to writing and I'm not no like veteran writer but it's just kind of knowing your content better than anybody else and then you know there's I don't I don't I'm, I've never been you know I didn't go to school for writing I don't know all the ins and outs and technical terms but I do the couple of things that I found very helpful is the you know the, the biggest rule is sort of to know how it ends first because then it's easy to get there right and, and I do find writing a, a log line is really helpful because if you can't write a log line, your story probably is, you don't know what it is yet. You know, um, and I think a lot of people fight that. They think, oh, that's simplifying it. It's more complicated than that. It's, I can't do one sentence. You're crazy. But if you can do that, then it probably means you've got a pretty cool, concise story that other people will understand, you know? Right. All right, thanks. Um, Jillian, there was a question for you. Uh, any advice on, uh, on pitching a screenplay if you're a first time writer? Any advice on how to go about pitching it? Well, I could say, yeah, I mean, don't dis, you know, don't say uh, negative things about yourself. <laughs> in the, you know, it's really good to believe in, and I do think the idea of a sentence, uh, you know, it's funny. I, I think just even now when you asked us to describe our screenplays, I actually have a sentence. I would never have pitched it the way I just described it. And that would, I thought, oh yeah, I could have just done that. Um, but I think having less is more and um, yeah, knowing your character and your story really well, um, knowing answers to questions like what's your character's problem um, and um, being able to be you know the character is in is you in a pitch you know if you can or you can describe the character or answer any questions as if the character was being interviewed um, very easily I think that's really helpful um, I was also going to say there's I forgot I did this writing program uh, you know called Writers Boot Camp which I it, it still exists but I did that you know back in the day and um, they had this system where they, they, this is the only thing I took from it. It was almost like a cult. It was, you know, but it was kind of this amazing little system. It was like, when this happens, then this happens until this happens. It's very reductive, but they actually use that just for your log line. And then they use it for every 10 pages. And then they use it for the three acts. And um, I often go back to that idea and see, you know, and see, you don't really have to use all the words, but like, when somebody feels disillusioned with their life, they then go back in time until they realize that they weren't who they thought they were. Or, you know, there's, it's a very easy way of, and I think that's also good for pitching to be, uh, to be able to think about it in that way. But um, I think the most important thing is to be, to be confident um, in what you say. Even if when you say it, you go, why did I say that? That's not it. You just, you know, nobody knows that unless you, make a face and don't think don't think about you know don't judge yourself while you're doing it who cares yeah you know can i say something about pitching and i don't i've never had to, i've never pitched a like just a script but i've pitched a million concepts you know and tv ideas and uh and i found that you know when i started doing it early on i would try to be like 
all so prepared, like ultra prepared or all this. And, and, and like, because I was sort of, I think I was given some bad advice at the beginning, like practice it at home, have us, you know, make sure you know. And I would try to do that. And it just doesn't work for me. Like I can't, I can't be prepared. <laughs> you know? It's just, I fail because, you know, I'm just trying to remember what was I supposed to. And I found that my most successful pitches uh, were ones I just went in with enthusiasm and f feel like I'm bringing them a, maybe a unique voice that they don't see every day coming through their office. And those are the times that stuff has happened. I remember in particular, I went in to, I got, for some reason I ended up meeting at the time, the guy who ran uh, Disney uh, animation for television, this guy, uh, Mike Moon. And we had met and he was like, you should come in and like, we'll hang out. And I was like, yeah, absolutely. And I had no, no idea. I had no animation idea. I didn't, you know, it wasn't even something that was on my radar. Um, but I went in anyway. And I just kind of like got excited about being there and had a re super really rough idea. And I, I remember I had Photoshopped some picture and I had it on my phone. I was like, well, I have this, you know, and I showed them. They're like, we'd like to see that, you know. And, uh, and so I ended up doing a development deal with them and making like a, it didn't end up going to series, but it was like one of those things where I went in with nothing but a good attitude and enthusiasm and it worked as opposed to going in with, you know, some crazy, like never ending, like story of the, you know, and everyone just kind of tunes out. And uh, cause I think in, in a, a lot of ways when you're, certainly when you're pitching an idea or concept or a TV show, or you're selling yourself as much as you are the, the idea, like, cause they, you know, they want to work with you, you know, um, and, if, and if your idea is great, but you seem like, you know, like a, just such a, difficult person or then you're going to blow it. So I, I don't know. That would be my, I just go in, I don't stress about it. If I go in to meet somebody, I'm just like, whatever. Like even with this, I woke up, I'm like, I don't know what I'm supposed to say. I'm just gonna have a conversation with whoever's on the screen and not even think about it, not get my notes ready. And what did, how did I, you know, and just, and I feel like that always works best for me anyway. All right. All right. Um, there was a question um, for both of you. What is the best way to go about getting your screenplay out there? other than film festivals? I, I have to say, I have never, th this was a weird other thing to me, like to, I, you know, to send a screenplay in and answer, enter a contest. I've never done anything like that. I think it feels like Spider and I have very similar approaches. Like, you know, yeah. I'm like, hey, go inside and be really enthusiastic. Tell them about your idea and tell them, and you know, and seem flexible, you know, like, you know, you if you know your idea, then you know what to bring it to. As far as the screenplay thing, I mean, my inclination is always to make something. Yeah. Um, but if you don't have the money, you know, I'm not going to make, go out and write at this point right now, make, shoot this whole feature. But um, yeah, this is not, this isn't an, for me to have sent this here is, I don't really know the advice. I, I like my um, writer's assistant or person I'm collaborating with, Sarah Abdullah, she's on right now too. And she went to film school. She graduated from Columbia, you know, screenwriting. And so I would just ask her, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I really don't, um, I think when it's finished, then I would go, I don't know, Spider, what would you say? I, I have no clue. I, I guess I have, um, you know, I've pitched a lot of nonfiction too. I pitch shows all the time and I pitch, uh, you know, fiction and nonfiction. So probably I'd call production companies, um, you know, sort of, I, I think connections that you have, or I guess if you don't have connections, do, oh, do a reading, you know, start doing, I've done that a lot of times, even on Zoom and hear what you're doing and then sort of spread the word. I don't know, what, what is the right advice? I have no idea. Yeah, I, I, uh, I'm a similar, I have a exact mindset where I've always been in like, it's like, I feel like that we live in a show me culture. So I just make stuff. And I learned that early. I almost through my own ignorance and arrogance. Uh, if I go back to my original, the show that I had Death Valley, I, I had uh, just in the beginning, I just had the idea. And uh, I, a pr pretty pretty big production company. Um, I had a friend who knew the head of the production company, and he wanted to meet me. And and we, I told him about it. He loved it. And, and within a week, we were at Showtime. We were at Sci-Fi. We were at all these places pitching this idea, and we weren't selling it. 
And I asked him one, and one day I was like, I was like, I don't know, man. Like, I don't think like just talking about it is working, you know, because it involved monsters and it involved vampires and zombies. And it's like, I don't know, we say vampire, they might be thinking Bela Lugosi, but I'm thinking 30 days a night, you know what I mean? And, and so he said, no, 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 no. This is the way we do it. This is how it goes. We go in. And I was like, being like, like I said, completely ignorant. I was like, well, you know what, dude, thanks, but I'm going to go on my own. And I walked away from this, <laughs> these, these like big production company. And that's when I went and made this little trailer. By my, I spent 500 bucks and bought some, got some friends and rented a cop uniform and had some makeup artists that I knew help me out. And that's what sold the show. It got to MTV and the, the exact, he said, he, he told me later, he goes, I put your trailer on. And within five seconds, I was like, I want this show. And so that's how I function all the time. I, I write these short horror fit scripts. I don't just put them in a drawer. I go film them, you know? And so now I've built up this catalog of stuff that I've made. And I feel like that way you also have a much better way of, you know, if you can get it close, it may not be perfect, but if you can get close enough, then there's no excuses. You know, you don't, if you're showing it to somebody like, this is what it is. You, you want to get on board or you don't because you, it's, clear what you've just made instead of sometimes a script can be and, and also I, I imagine getting somebody to read a hundred page script is not easy to do you know I'd rather make something and but in terms of just getting us if you have a script on your computer or, or you know on paper I don't know I find that it's just like you build up relationships over the years of people that in those are the people I go to first like who do I know that might think this is cool and that's basically how I start Right. Um, and then there was a question when you come up with a concept, how do you decide if it should be a feature, a short, or a TV pilot? Any thoughts? Yeah. Oh, I mean, I think that, I, I mean, I think a good story can function for, uh, as in any of those formats. Um, I have different loves of, di of, for everything. You know, I'm obviously, you know, I, I've been recently doing shorts and I find those are in some ways more challenging than doing a, a full feature script even though you know it's much less page it you have to do so many interesting turns in such a short amount of time but um but i don't know like i think that you know some stories just feel like they you they need to like breathe and live longer and those are their tv ideas and you know features are more like you want to make a sort of like a strong statement in you know in a, in a shorter amount of time and Short films for me are more, they function more like, almost like a joke, you know, like uh, there's like sort of like a punchline and a twist and, you know, and it, it, it catches you off guard. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I think a good story is a good story. You could, you could manipulate it to be any of those things. And yeah, Jillian, I mean, you've written feature screenplays, but you've also, you know, written quite a bit of television as well. How do you decide if something is meant for a feature film or for a TV or maybe? I, I mean, I think that's a really good question. And I, I actually think that you for me it, it i want to know why i'm what the medium is you know it's that passover question thing like why why is this what it is you know like uh what are you know what is that why why on this day or whatever not that i know anything about passover really but i just know that that's the you know the question of the format like i've been making a longitudinal verite documentary for five years and um so my character, I thought they were going to um, have this really strong arc when I met them. And there actually has, very, has had very little change over the course of five years. And it's been really challenging to try to cut it. And um, there was a peer, and I thought, oh, well, if I make this into a short, then do I not have to follow that same structure? Or can I, you know, so, I, and I actually ended up deciding that it isn't a short um and finding a different way in but i do think it has to do with you know what's what's your character what do you want the character to start out i mean obviously in fiction you have more control over this but um who is this person in the beginning and who is this person in the end and what's going to happen in the middle and you know if you have a you know i i thought about the please to meet me script oh could this be a conceit that could be a tv series and how would that unfold and, and that would mean developing much smaller little 
pieces. And ultimately in a television show, the person generally doesn't arrive at the goal because you're stretching, you know, if it's a series, it depends, or you're stretching it out longer, or it, they will never get at the, you know, if you look at sitcoms, they just, those people are always having this challenge that they don't arrive at, you know, they don't become a different person because then the show would be over. Um, so I, I think it's about thinking about what, how, you know, how you want that story to unfold and why you're choosing the format. And you may not know that when you start out. I don't think you have to, I think you could start telling a story on paper or even if you're outlining it. And, um, you know, I don't usually know the ending, but if I get to a sense of like, oh, well, what's the, what's the distance between the beginning and the end? as I wrote, and then I would decide how I think it would be. I've also started turning things into audio, like I've taken documentaries and turning them into, um, you know, podcasts and, and sort of seeing well, what's missing here. And that's really interesting as even as, as a fiction writer, um, because you only have what you recorded and you have to fill it in with voiceover. And so I think structurally, it really depends on where you want to, you know, how long you want to that story to last and where you want it to begin and end. You know, I made you, when you were speaking, it made me think of what, like a, what mo I feel like movies are based on an event mm -hmm. and TV shows are based on s circumstance. In other, so in other words, like, like take Jaws for instance, like Jaws wouldn't be a good TV series because they all, they're, they're just trying to catch the shark. Like how long is it going to take them to catch this? You know, there's a, there's an event that they're trying to, you know, a Rocky is going to win this fight, right? But if you had a TV show, you could have a TV show about a guy who runs a boat chartering business in Martha's Vineyard. And every week it's a different event, you know, things like that. You know, like that is a TV show. That's not a movie. Um, but, you know, or, or, you know what I'm saying? So like, I think that if, if I think about great movies, it's, movies, it's generally speaking, it's based on, you know, one singular event that has to get accomplished. Whereas even a traditional network show like a Grey's Anatomy, it's just people who work in a hospital. So every day it's a different thing that happens and, you know, and they have relationship in this person, you know. And, and so I think that's the difference between if you, in, in other words, you could have a Grey's Anatomy movie, but it would be about somebody got in an accident and they have to save them and that's it. And the beginning and end of the story, you know what I mean? That's, I was thinking like Fargo is an interesting, you know, when that was turned into a, a series, I, I mean, I was like, what the hell is this going to be? But, and, and that's a very loosely thematic, you know, but that is a story that's un unfolding, you know, each season like um, a movie, but yes, it, it's, what do you think about that? Because that's a limited series, but um, in terms of, why do you think that that is a series? Because they wanted to do something as an homage to Fargo or the movie, but what do you think about those um, different seasons of Fargo? Why are they a TV show and not a movie? Well, I'm guilty. I haven't seen the Fargo TV show, so I don't really know, but I, but I would, uh, having not seen it, and <laughs> I'll make an opinion on it anyway, but I mean, it's, I assume it follows the lives of cops, right, in Fargo. So it's, a, no? Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I actually, I don't think necessarily, Necessarily, I mean, it is, but it, it's, but it is, it, it is like a really long, I mean, that's the thing. If you're doing an evergreen series, that's really different than a, um, a series that has eight episodes and it's going to end. Like, those are like long ass movies. Those were, you know, that, that is a show. Yeah. Um, but I think that they're exploring more storylines and they do develop like a movie, but, um. But I do think that there is, there's like, I find that even great shows after, for me, after three or four seasons, I'm kind of like, eh, okay. Like I, even if it's still, the quality is still there. I just sort of like, I run out of steam for it. You know what I mean? Um, so I do think that, the, you know, and I think because we live in a culture, I think, you know, there's season 17 of, and I just like, I don't, at this point, I don't care. Like something feels like it should wrap up at some point, you know? Once it becomes a musical, and it was, you know, like, actually, I, I feel like um, Grey's Anatomy, I didn't watch very much of that, but um, I do know that I one time turned it on and it was a musical, 
<laughs> I was like, I'm not, I can't ever watch this again. Like how that was like, what are we going to do now? So yeah, it was just like grinding the break without the pad anymore. You know? well, I think TV has changed a lot too. I think there used to be the TV rule was every, you know, each week was exactly the same, but different. In other words, like Star Trek, right? The ship would fly to its planet. Spock and Kirk would beam down and they'd have some interaction with some conflict with some alien. And, and every week was essentially the same, but just different, different alien, different planet. But now I don't, I think that that's frowned upon as a, as a TV concept. I think, you know, TV, like you said, successful TV now are just, are just like really long movies, you know, really high quality. I would, just, I want to just add one thing, or if, um, is somebody gave me some um, good advice about when I, I wrote a, a, a Bible for a fictional TV show. And they said that to think about every cast of TV characters as a family. And I'm, I don't know if this is something that everybody knows or not, but um, so that if you look at any television series, they work, they function as a family. Everybody plays a sort of traditional familial role in a way. And and families, you know, they never end. They just go on and they torture each other and they love each other. And and so I think that's an interesting thought in a screenplay. That's not how it is. But it's it's more about the dynamics of the characters and between each other than the plot. Um, somebody asked about dialogue. They asked in the, in the Q&A box there, uh, when you know if dialogue is working? Oh, I love dialogue. That's all. I, I When I'm writing, I... I just can't wait to get past the action description to just get to the dialogue. And I tend to keep my action super simple, like over, maybe oversimplified, you know, um, because I just, the, the fun of writing is writing dialogue for me. And I think that you just have to be, there's a couple of things that I, I try to do is one, I just have, you have to be really observant that most people don't speak clearly. And most people don't say much. And I, because, you know, it drives me crazy. Whenever I, you have this, I have this radar that goes off when I'm watching a movie or watching a TV show and I can just picture the writer sitting behind their computer going, oh, that's, that's a cool line. Like, you don't ever want to like feel that feeling. Like someone wrote that. So it's this idea of understanding how people naturally speak and they stammer and they don't always have the right thing to say. It's not like this is us moment where someone says some amazing thing and everything suddenly gets works out you know i think it's just uh and i and i find too for me what's really helpful in writing dialogue is to create characters that really function in their own space you know um you know i've, I've read other people's scripts sometimes and i find the big mistake everyone does is everyone kind of just sounds the same you know i don't know who dave or joe or St steve are because they all talk exactly the same but if you think about your own group of friends one of your friends, you know, never talks. The other friend never shuts up. One friend's loud, one friend's quiet. And I think that that's how you have to approach realistic dialogue is to realize that people are unique and they speak in different ways. And um, to try to infuse that into your, your dialogue is really helpful. And don't ever make them say the other person's name like, Kathy, you can't do it. Because no one does that. Like, no one ever calls you by your name. You know, so anyway, I, I try to always avoid that. <laughs> Um, so we have time here for one last question. Somebody asked, uh, as a writer, what advice would you give to your younger self? I, I just wrote that screenplay. <laughs> um, <laughs> you go first. Oh, yeah. uh, well, you mean like it, you advice in life or just as a writer? Oh, just like writer. Uh, screenwriting advice. If you met your younger self, what would you, what advice would you give? I would say, I would say the most important part when you go to write something is to understand there's a difference between a premise and a story. In other words, like it's easy to come up with a cool premise. Like, oh, I wanna write a, sto a story about like zombies that attack somebody's house. And it's like, well, that's not a story. That's, a that's an idea, it's a premise. You have to come up with a story. What's the story? Oh, well, it was a girl who was about to sell her house because she needed the money to do it, but then zombies attacked. And now suddenly, oh, wait, there's a story here. This girl needs something she needs, you know, and I think that that's a thing that a lot of people get lost in. They, they come up with it. They want to make an, you know, like I said, they have a, they have an idea, a premise, but 
that's not always the same as a story. And I, I'm, my favorite movies are movies that are, there's what the movie is about and then what the movie means. And I think if you can get those two things happening, then you've got a successful story. In other words, you know what I mean? In other words, like Rocky is about a guy who has a boxing match. But what it means is a man who is, you know, looking in the mirror and seeing a worthless human being and needs this fight to redeem himself to feel like he's a worthy person in the world. You know what I mean? So like, I think that that's a really important thing to have those two things, like ask yourself those two questions. Right, the boxing is symbolism, really. Yeah. I, I, I realized I have very specific advice to my younger self. One is finish everything. Don't start things and not finish them. That doesn't mean that you, you there are sometimes things are done before you finish writing an entire screenplay, knowing when you've done something and knowing when to stop working on something it, and just, you know, sort of discerning between when you feel stuck versus like, oh, I tried doing this idea and it actually doesn't work and I'm going to, I'm going to put it to bed. But the more things you can take from beginning to end, the more satisfied you'll feel later. It's like, you know, reading Moby Dick is on my resume. You know, I read that to the end, you know, that was a beautiful book and I would have really, I, I appreciate in general things, taking things from beginning to end is, is just the most um, satisfying thing you can do in the most way, the way you can learn the most. And also knowing that everything you're doing is part of the process. I can say this book, um, Seeing is Forgetting the Name of the Thing One Sees is a book by Robert Irwin. That was the most inspiring book about being an artist to me where that he will allow himself the time to take for the process. And it doesn't seem like he judges himself for falling asleep in front of a piece of art that he's working on because that's part of figuring out what you're doing. So if you're not doing it at the speed you want or that, you know, or you or you are organizing your drawers or whatever in between, that's just another ver you know, way of doing it. So giving yourself a break, but seeing things through. Right. So yeah, there's like 20 more questions. <laughs> so uh, I got nothing else to do. <laughs> yeah, so we do have, we do have to, uh, to, to bring it to a close, uh, but is there a way that any of the participants can perhaps keep in touch with either of you in some way? Is there like a website or social media uh, email if they have a, an additional question or something like that. I, I mean, mean I'm, 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 oh, go ahead, sorry. No, no, you. Oh, I mean, I'm on all the usual places, Instagram and Twitter, and, you know, I don't even know what my things are, but just look up Spider One and you'll find me. Um, and I'm not, you know, I, if it's, it's, people can reach out there and DM me and, you know, I can't promise I'll answer everybody, but they're definitely like, if specifically about this kind of stuff, I'd be happy to talk, you know. Okay, Spider One on Instagram, right? Yeah, I don't know what, let me look it up. Let me tell you what it is exactly. <laughs> yeah, Spider One. Cool, all right. Jillian, are you on, I don't know, maybe LinkedIn or some something? Uh, I'm on nothing. I mean, I might be on LinkedIn, but that wouldn't, I just wouldn't, I don't go on there. Um, website, I, a website? I have a website, JillianGunther.com. Okay. Um, and I, think you can reach me on there but if you you could email me and I if I feel like I have something to offer I'll totally write you back but if it's a question that I don't know that would be helpful or that I can't you know I don't I won't but it won't be because anything personal so yeah my email you could write me at is um uh miss gunther m-i-s-s-g-u-n-t-h-e-r at um, gmail.com. Is, is there two S's in that? Yeah. Okay, all right, just put it into the... Uh... But really, be think about when you write me, look on my website and see if you really, you know, I'm not just like, I, you know, I think both of us are unusual um, career path people and um, make sure you think I'm the right person to answer the question because before you write. <laughs> All right. Not, you know. All right, cool. So yeah, we have your info there in the chat box, MissGunther at gmail.com. The website's JillianGunther.com. Uh, Spider1 is on Instagram. So, um, so yeah.
that's uh, uh, that's the conclusion. I want to thank Spider. I want to thank Jillian for being here. I want to thank all of the participants for being here and asking such great questions. And um, thank you all so much. And we will uh, hopefully see see you again soon. Thanks, guys. Oh, if you want to watch my documentary pull out, you can totally write to me, and I'll send you a link for free. Okay. <laughs> okay. Sounds good. Uh, pull out uh, is the documentary. Okay. Thank you so much. And uh, we will, we'll see you soon. Thank you. Okay. Bye, right. everyone. Bye.